Summary of Latter-day Pamphlets. Thomas Carlyle. 1850. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. 1. The Present Time. The present ever a new era to the thinking man, to know it, and what it bids us do, the sum of knowledge for us all. Judicial blindness. Our own days, if not days of endless hope too, then are they days of utter despair. A reforming Pope, and the huge unreformable Popedom. The Sicilians first to follow the poor Pope's example. French exasperation and emulation. European explosion, boundless, uncontrollable, all kings conscious they are but play actors. A weltering mob, presided over by M. de Lamartine. A changed lime since the word senior was first devised to signify superior. Universal democracy, an inevitable fact of the days we live in. Whence comes it? Whither goes it? What is the meaning of it? High shouts of exultation from the universal foolish human throat, drowning for the moment all reflection whatsoever. Bankruptcy of imposture, at all costs, it is to be prayed by all men that shams may cease. Heavy side, and as quiet blasphemy. Democracy not a government, nor parliament a practical substitute for a king. Unanimity of voting will do nothing for us, if the voting happen to be wrong. A divine message, or eternal regulation of the universe, there verily is, in regard to every conceivable procedure of man. Universal suffrage, and the ballot box. The ancient republics, now pretty well admitted to be nothing to our purpose. One modern instance of democracy, nearly perfect, the Republic of the United States. America too will have to strain her energies, in quite other fashion than this, America's battle is yet to fight. Mere democracy forever impossible, the universe itself a monarchy and hierarchy. God Almighty's noble in the supreme place, under penalties. Everlasting privilege of the foolish, to be governed and guided by the wise, intrinsically, the harshest duty a wise man, if he be indeed wise, has laid to his hand. The new sacrament of divorce, called enfranchisement, emancipation. West Indian blacks and Irish whites, horses and half-brothers, the fate of all emancipated helplessness, sooner or later, tragically inevitable. British industrial existence fast becoming one huge poison swamp of reeking pestilence, 30,000 outcast, ungoverned, unguided needlewomen. Constituted anarchy, British liberty, and what it is doing for us. England and her constitution, the model of the world, at once unattainable by the world, and not worth attaining. Called a second time to show the nations how to live. England's one hope, many kings, not needing election to command, poor England never so needed them as now. The true commander and king, not quite discoverable by riddling of the popular clamor. The fateful Hebrew prophecy, sounding daily through our streets. In regard to choice of men, next to no capability on the part of universal suffrage. The few wise will have, by one method or another, to take, and to keep, command of the innumerable foolish. Captains of industry, organization of labor, the new strange task which no government can much longer escape. Speech of the British Prime Minister to his pauper populations and the respectable professors of the dismal science. Alas, there are things that should be done, not spoken, that till the doing of them is begun, cannot be spoken. 2. Model prisons. The deranged condition of our affairs, two ways of proceeding in regard to them, selfish indifference, and self-lauding philanthropy. Indiscriminate mashing up of right and wrong, ending in a fraternity like Cain's, a London prison of the exemplary or model kind. Certain Chartist notabilities undergoing their term. The captain of the place, a true Aristos and commander of men. His problem, to drill 1200 scoundrels to do nothing, by the method of kindness. Happy devil's regiments of the line, what soldier to any earthly or celestial power has such lodging and attendance as you hear? Certainly it should not be the devil's regiments of the line, that a servant of God would first of all concentrate his attention on. Precisely the worst investment for benevolence that human ingenuity could select. The highest and best investment, solemn shams and supreme quacks, riding prosperously in every thoroughfare. Howard the philanthropist, a sort of beatified individual, a dull practical solid man, full of English accuracy and veracity. Not the only benefactor that has worked without money for us, the destiny's opulent. Milton, Kepler, Dante. Cholera doctors, soldiers, human virtue, if we went down to the roots of it, not so rare. Woe to us, it is so seldom elaborated, and built into a result. The benevolent platform fever, and general morbid sympathy, instead of hearty hatred, for scoundrels. Brotherhood? Be the thought far from me. Beautiful black peasantry, fallen idol, interesting white felonry, not idol. What a reflection, that we cannot bestow on an unworthy man any particle of our benevolence, 
without withdrawing it from one to whom it of right belongs. One thing needful for the world, but that one indispensable, give us justice, and we live, give us only counterfeits or succedania, and we die. Modern ghastly phantasm of Christianity, which they sing litanies to at Exeter Hall and elsewhere. Poor old genius of reform, and his program of a new era. Christian religion, and its healthy hatred of scoundrels, from the Christianity of Oliver Cromwell to that of Mr. Hesperus Fiddlestring, what a road have we travelled. Gospel according to the platform, exeat fiddlestring. Poor creatures, making and unmaking laws, in whose souls is no image or thought of heaven's law, human statute books, growing horrible to think of. What to do with our criminals? An official law dignitaries bland perplexity, and placid discomfiture. Wonderful to hear what account we give of the punishment of our criminals, no revenge, oh heavens, no, can't moral. Can't religious. Can't political. Hunger stricken as fixied hearts, calling themselves Christian. Woe to the people that no longer venerate, as the emblem of God himself, the aspect of human worth. The true ground on which to deliberately slay a disarmed fellow man, revenge, and the ineradicable tendency to reventure oneself on the wrongdoer, to pay him what he has merited. How it shall be done. A vast question, involving immense considerations. Terrible penalties of neglecting to treat hero as hero, and scoundrel as scoundrel, dim oblivion of right and wrong, worldwide maddening misery, new astonishing phallus worship, and universal sacrament of divorce. The ancient Germans, and their grim public executions. Scoundrel as scoundrel, and no soft blubbering and litanying over him can make him a friend of this universe. A didactic sermon, as no spoken sermon could be. Except upon a basis of just rigor, sorrowful, silent, inexorable, no true pity possible. A worst man in England, curious to think of, whom it would be inexpressibly advantageous to lay hold of, and hang, first of all, alas, our supreme scoundrel, alike with our supreme hero, very far from being known. Parliament, in its lawmakings, must really try to obtain some vision again. Let us to the wellheads, to the chief fountains of these waters of bitterness, and there strike home and dig. 3. Downing Street ineffectuality of our red tape establishments. The colonial office, a worldwide jungle, inhabited by doleful creatures, deaf or nearly so to human reason and entreaty. Foreign office and home office perhaps even more impracticable, Hercules Harlequin, the attorney triumphant, the world's busybody, these not the parts this nation has a turn for. Proposed curtailments, rectifications and reformations, England's forlorn hope in Sir Robert Peel, the one likely or possible man. A reformed executive in Downing Street, not a better talking apparatus, but an infinitely better acting apparatus the thing wanted. The Irish giant advancing unheeded upon London itself. Two kinds of fundamental error in our government offices, the work ill done, and, what is still fataler, the wrong kind of work. For such elaborated idleness a stupid subaltern better than a gifted one. For an eye that could see in those hideous mazes, and a heart that could dare and do, what the British nation at this time really wants. If our government is to be a no government, what matter who administers it? the real nimrod of this era the ratcatcher. The mighty question, who is to be our premier, and take in hand the spigot of taxation. Right Honorable Zero, on his Sleswick Thunder Horse. Who made those Downing Street offices. No edifice of state that stands long, but has had the wise and brave contributing their lives to it. William Conqueror's Home Office. An English 74, and the old Seekings and Saxon pirates, human stupidity the accursed parent of all our sorrows. Practical reverence for human worth the outcome and essence of all true religions whatsoever. Human intellect, the exact summary of human worth. Abler men in Downing Street, that, sure enough, would gradually remedy whatsoever has gone wrong amongst us. The divinest, most Herculean ten men to be found among the English twenty-seven millions. Courage, let us strive all thitherward as towards a door of hope. One intellect still really human, not to be dispensed with anywhere in the affairs of men, only wisdom, that can recognize wisdom, and attract it, as with divine magnetism, from the modest corners where it lies hid. To increase the supply of human intellect in Downing Street, what method alas? One small project of improvement, government servants to be selected without reference to their power of getting into parliament, the crown to have power to elect a few members. Beneficent germs, which one truly wise man as chief minister might ripen into living practices, invaluable to us all a population counting by millions from which to choose, were a seat in Parliament not primary, Robert Burns. All true democracy in this, that the able man be chosen, in whatever rank he be found, a truer and truer aristocracy, or government of the best. One true reforming statesman, he the preliminary of all good. A strange feeling, 
to be at the apex of English affairs. This world, solid as it looks, made all of aerial and even of spiritual stuff. This and the other premier seems to take it with perfect coolness, reflections, sufficient to annihilate any man, almost before starting. Ask well, who is your chief governor, for around him men like to him will infallibly gather. Time was when an incompetent governor could not be permitted among men. 3. The New Downing Street. How the European governments came to wreck for want of intellect. No evil, or solecism against nature, ever yet wrought its own cure. Intellect has to govern, and will do it, if not in alliance, then in hostility, every government absolves or convicts itself, before God and man, according as it determines which, the old Catholic Church, in its terrestrial relations to the state, everywhere a road upwards for human nobleness lay wide open to all men. Over Europe generally the state has died, incapable in these years of any but galvanic life. The kind of heroes that come mounted on the shoulders of universal suffrage. England called as no nation ever was, to summon out its kings, and set them to their work, a new Downing Street, inhabited by the gifted, directing all its energies upon real and living interests. The notion that government can do nothing but keep the peace. To be governed by small men, profess subjection to phantasms, not only a misfortune, but a curse and sin. Indigent millionaires, and their owl dreams of political economy. Only the man of worth can recognize worth in men. How a new Downing Street might gradually come. The Foreign Office, in its reformed state, insignificance of recent European wars. Our war soldiers industrial, doing nobler than Roman works, when fighting is not wanted of them. Ministers of works, of justice, of education, tomorrow morning they might all begin to be, constitutions for the colonies, now on the anvil, so many as are for rebelling, hold up your hands. Our brave fathers, one year valiant blood and sweat, gained for us rich possessions in all zones, and we, wretched imbeciles, cannot do the function of administering them. Miserable. Theory than that of money on the ledger for the primary rule of empires, cannot well be propounded, England will not readily admit that her own children are worth nothing but to be flung out of doors. Canadian parliaments, and lumber log governors. Choose well your governor, and having found him, keep him. The home office, undoubtedly our grand primary concern. Were all men doing their duty, or even seriously trying to do it, there would be no pauper, pauperism, our social sin grown manifest. Our public life and our private, our state and our religion, a tissue of half-truths and whole lies, Cicero's Roman augurs and their divine chicken bowels, despicable amalgam of true and false. A complete course of scavengerism, the thing needed. The state, as it gets into the track of its real work, will find it expand into whole continents of new activity, the one of wants, more indispensable than any jewel in the crown, that of men able to command men in the ways of well-doing. Wasteland industrial succeeding, other kinds of industry will be found capable of regimenting. He is a good man that can command and obey, he that cannot is a bad. Eaton's and Oxford's, with their broken crumbs of mere speech, our next set of souls overseers, perhaps silent very mainly. Who of living statesmen will begin the long steep journey of reform? Sir Robert Peel at his eleventh hour. Still fatal omens. 4. Stump order. Our deep-rooted habit of considering human talent as best of all evincing itself in eloquent speech, such a test liable to become the very worst ever devised. Hard sayings for many a British reader, the talker established in the place of honor, and the doer lost and lamed in the obscure crowd. Eloquence, and the part it now plays in our affairs, one of the gravest phenomena, universities and schools in the old healthy ages, the working man, priest, young noble, the one sure method of learning anything, practical apprenticeship to it. Not that he may speak, but that he may have something to speak of, the first need of a man. Every word, either a note or a forged note. Do you want a man not to practice what he believes, then encourage him to speak it often in words, the serviceable thing, to clip off a bit of his eloquent tongue. What the art of speech should be, and should not be. Vital lungs of society, methods by which men rise, and the kind of men. The country that can offer no career, a doomed country, nay already dead. Our English careers to born genius twofold, silent or unlearned career of industrialisms, articulate or learned career of the three professions. To the gifted soul, not of taciturn, beaver nature, the field in England narrow and surprising to an extreme, the solitary proof feet of talk, getting rather monotonous. Medicine, and its frightful medusa heads of quackery, the profession of human healer radically a sacred one. Law and church, ingenuous souls just now shudder at the threshold of both these careers. Parliament, and its unquestioned eligibility, if attainable. Crowded portal of literature, haven of expatriated spiritualisms, vanities and prurient imbecilities. 
talk with tongue or pen, there is in our England of the 19th century, that one method of emergence and no other. Not even in Parliament should the essential function by any means be talk. Wisdom intrinsically of silent nature. Politeness, and breeding to business, how politeness was invented, Johnson, Burns. Parliament, as a school of manners, seeking salvation in appearances. A parliamentary bagpipe, and your living man fled away without return. Nature admits no lie, most men profess to be aware of this, but few in any manner lay it to heart. Diagnosis of a lie, and liar. Fail, by any sin or misfortune, to discover what the truth of a face is, you are lost so far as that fact goes, unfortunate British Parliament. Nature's silent exact savings bank, an official register, correct to the most evanescent item, creditor, by the quantity of veracities we have done, debtor, by the quantity of falsities and errors. The practice of modern parliaments, with reporters sitting among them. A benevolent plan of reform for our benighted world, at least one generation to pass its life in silence. Good heavens, if such a plan were practicable, how the chaff might be winnowed out of every man and thing, I service, our saddest woe of all. Public speaking, parliamentary eloquence, a Moloch before whom young souls are made to pass through the fire, to come out spiritually dead. Be not a public order, thou brave young British man, not a stump order, if thou canst help it, to speak, or to write, nature did not peremptorily order thee, but to work she did. 6. Parliaments. The present editor not one of those who expect to see the country saved by farther reforming the reformed parliament we have got. If the captains of the ship are of that scandalous class who refuse to be warned, what are the miserable crew to do? The English Parliament, windy and empty as it has grown to be, at one time a quite solid serious actuality, King Rufus and his barons, the time of the Edwards, when Parliament gradually split itself into two houses. The long Parliament the first that declared itself sovereign in the nation. A sad gradual falling off in modern Parliaments, a solemn convocation of all the stump orders in the nation, to come and govern us, not seen in the earth until recently. Two grand modern facts, which have altered from top to bottom the function and position of all parliaments. An unfettered press, not the discussion of questions, only the ultimate voting of them, requires to go on, or can veritably go on, in St. Stephen's now. Still more important the question. King present there, or no king? Not as a sovereign ruler of the 27 million British souls has the reformed parliament distinguished itself as yet. Another most unfortunate condition, that your parliamentary assembly is not much in earnest to do even the best it can. Parliaments, admirable only as advising bodies. United States. Only two parliaments of any actual sovereignty, the English Long Parliament, and the French Convention. The horoscope of parliaments by no means cheering at present, the thing we vitally need, not a more and more perfectly elected parliament, but some reality of a ruling sovereign to preside over parliament. Poor human beings, whose practical belief is, that if we vote this or that, so this or that will thenceforth be. Blundering, impious, pretended laws, is arithmetic a thing more fixed by the eternal than the laws of justice are? Eternal law, silently present everywhere and every when. Voting a thing of little value at any time, if of ten men, nine are recognizable as fools, how will you ever get a ballot box to grind out a wisdom from their votes, under whatever reform Downing Street England be governed, its parliament too will continue indispensable, we must set it to its real function, and, at our peril in its, restrict it to that. Necessary to the king or governor to know what the mass of men think upon public questions, he may thus choose his path with prudence, and reach his aim surely, if more slowly. The lemming rat, and its rigidly straight course no whither. The mass of men consulted at the hustings upon any high matter, as ugly an exhibition of human stupidity as this world sees. The vulgarest vulgar, not those in ragged coats at this day, the more the pity. Of what use towards the finding out what it is wise to do can the fool's vote be? You have to apprise the unwise man of his road, even as you do the unwiser horse. Memorable minorities, and even small ones, Cromwell and his Puritans, Tancred of Odeville's sons. Unit of that class, against as many zeros as you like. What is to become of Parliament, less a question than what is to become of Downing Street. Who is slave, and eternally appointed to be governed, who free, and eternally appointed to govern. Could we entirely exclude the slave's vote, and admit only the heroic free man's vote, the ultimate new era, and best possible condition of human affairs, had actually come. New definitions of slavery, and of freedom. To the free man belongs eternally the government of the world. 6. Hudson's statue. The question shall Cromwell have a statue? A people worthy to build statues to Cromwell, or worthy only of doing it to Hudson. Show the man you honor, 
and you show what your ideal of manhood is, what kind of man you long inexpressibly to be. Pity Hudson's statue was not completed and set up, so that all the world might see it, the practical English mind has its own notions of the supreme excellence, and in this of Hudson there was more of real worship than is usual, if the world were not properly anarchic, this question of a statue would be one of the greatest and most solemn for it, not lightly will a man give his reverence, if he be still a man. A hierarchy of beneficences, the noblest man at the summit of affairs, and in every place the due gradation of the fittest for the place, all hangs upon giving our approval a right. How statues are now got up. Dismal, symbolic population of British statues, the kind of aristocracy popular suffrage would choose for us. Hudson a king, elected by the people, as none other is or was, his value as a demigod, as a maker of railways. Answer to Jefferson Brick, the American editor, touching overgrown worthless dukes, and undergrown incredible bishops, our ugliest anomalies, done by universal suffrage, not by patent, Bobus of Houndsditch. This universal ousting of imaginary governors, to issue in the attainment of governors who have a right and a capacity to govern. Ballot box and suffrage machine. Alas, could we once get laws which were just, the bravest of existing men on the throne, and on the gibbet the veritable supreme scoundrel of the commonwealth. Universal suffrage, equivalent to abject helplessness and flat despair. Peace? Better war to the knife, war till we all die, than such a peace, hero worship, this universe holy, this temporary flame image of the eternal, one beautiful and terrible energy of heroisms, presided over by a divine nobleness, or infinite hero. Hypocritical idolatries, sets of gods or fetishes, to which prayers are mumbled, while the real worship, or heart's love and admiration, is elsewhere. Whom do you in your very soul admire, and strive to imitate and emulate, is it God's servant, or the devil's? There is no other religion in the man, of the slightest moment compared with this, immense asthmatic spiritual hurdy-gurdy. It was not always so, and even till lately was never so. Collins's dull old peerage book, properly all we English have for a national Bible, of these ancient peerages, a very great majority visibly had authentic heroes for their founders. One's heart is sore to think how far, how very far all this has vanished from us. Our one steady regulated supply, the class definable as supreme stump orders in the lawyer department. England wants a hierarchy, to the English modern populations. Supreme hero and supreme scoundrel, perhaps as nearly as is possible to human creatures, indistinguishable. High columns, raised by prurient stupidity and public delusion to gamblers and blockheads. The so-called Christian clerus, brave men many of them, after their sort, and in a position which we may admit to be wonderful and dreadful. But as to statues, and the mischief they are doing, the woods and forests really ought to interfere. 8. Jesuitism. For some two centuries past, the genius of mankind dominated by the gospel of Ignatius. What the English reader may think of it, and of his share in it. The spiritual, the parent and first cause of the practical. Thrice baleful universe of Kant, prophesied for these latter days, the universe makes no immediate objection to be conceived in any way. The saddest condition of human affairs, where men decree injustice by a law, a poor man, in our days, has many gods foisted on him, if Ignatius, worshipped by millions as a kind of god, is in eternal fact a kind of devil, surely it is pressingly expedient that men laid it awfully to heart. Ignatius Loyola, a man born greedy, full of prurient elements from the first. On the walls of Pompoluna, a wrecked Papon's digester. Reflections, true, salutary, and even somewhat of sacred, agonies of new birth. The true remedy for wrecked sensualism, to annihilate one's pruriency. Let eternal justice triumph on me, since it cannot triumph by me the voice of nature to a repentant outcast sinner turning again towards the realms of manhood, and the precept of all right Christianity too. Not so did Ignatius read the omens, the task he fixed upon is his. Wilt thou then, at the bidding of any pope, war against Almighty God? Frantic mortal, thy late pighood itself is trivial in comparison, precious message of salvation, salutary nature of falsehoods, and divine authority of things doubtful. Not victory for Ignatius and his black militia. Luther and Protestantism proper, Jean-Jacques and Protestantism improper. Vivaciousness of Jesuitism. Obedience good and indispensable, loyalty to Beelzebub, most conspicuous proof of caitiffhood within a man's possibility. This country tolerably cleared of Jesuits, expulsion of the Jesuit body of little avail, with the Jesuit soul so nestled in the life of mankind everywhere. Can't, and even sincere can't, heaven, when a man doing his sincerest is still but canting the coward solacement of composure and a whole skin. Deadly virus of lying, and such an odor as the angels never smelt before. 
awakening from the sleep of death into the sorcerer's Sabbath of anarchy. A man's religion, not the many things he tries to believe, but the few things he cannot doubt. The modern man's religion, what poor scantling of divine convictions he has. A singular piece of scribble, in Sourtag's hand, on pig philosophy, pigs of sensibility and superior logical parts, their religion, notion of the universe, and of their interests and duties there. The fine arts, by some thought to be a kind of religion, here too the consummate flower of consecrated unveracity reigns supreme. The new St. Stephen S., with its wilderness of stone pepper boxes. The fine arts, like the course and every art of man's God-given faculty, sent hither not to fib and dance, but to speak and work. Homer's Iliad, no fiction but a ballad history, the Hebrew Bible, before all things, true, as no other book ever was or will be. The history of every nation an epic and Bible, the clouded struggling image of a God's presence. Beyond doubt the Almighty Maker made this England too, and has been and forever is miraculously present here. What are the eternal covenants we can believe, and dare not for our life's sake but go and observe? These are our Bible, our God's Word, such as it may be. Miracles, worships, after their kind. No rhythmic history of England, but what we find in Shakespeare. Luxurious Europe, with its wits, storytellers, ballad singers, dancing girls, all the fine arts converted into after-dinner amusements. How all things hang together. Universal Jesuitism once lodged in the heart, you will see it in the very fingernails by and by. Our exodus from Houndsditch, Yankee gather coal, and his strange flashing torch gleams. How simple souls clamor occasionally for what they call a new religion. This universe, in all times, the express image of the human souls, and their thoughts and activities, who dwell there. The open secret, in these dark days a very shut one indeed. Surely this ignoble sluggishness, skeptical torpor, is not doomed to be our final condition. Under this brutal stagnancy there does lie painfully imprisoned some tendency which could become heroic.